Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College online journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, professor of history at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. At its most basic level, military strategy is about identifying and defending borders. And few borders are more contested than that between the professional military and the world of politics. The contestation is so intense because no one is exactly sure where to draw the line. Is it enough, as Samuel Huntington famously argued, to say that the military and politics should exist in completely separate spheres? Or should we accept or even welcome the idea that military leaders have a political role? If we believe they do have such a role, Where should we draw the line between political awareness and unacceptable partisanship? Does such a line even exist? Should it even exist? Our guest today, Dr. Celestino Perez, is deeply involved in the current scholarly dialogue on these very fraught questions. And he joins us here on A Better Peace as part of our ongoing conversation on civil military relations to discuss his own recent research and his assessment of the past, present, and future of those relations. Dr. Celestino, or Tino Perez, is an associate professor at the U.S. Army War College, where he holds the chair of executive and strategic leadership and is director of the Carlisle Scholars Program, which focuses on the integration of cutting-edge scholarship, experiential learning, and client-based research. Trained as a political theorist, he teaches policy, strategy, civil, and interstate wars, and military ethics, and is published widely in both academic and professional journals. Welcome to A Better Peace, Dr. Perez. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Ron. So, so, Tino, is the notion of an apolitical military practical or desirable? Well, we're jumping right into it. Yeah, why not, so, right? <laughs> uh, it, I'm going to say it depends on how you understand uh, uh, the term apolitical. What does it mm-hmm. mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the lessons I hope that uh, we draw from uh, today's conversation is that many of the words that we use in politics have multiple meanings. I'll go into that a little bit further later. But if we take the word apolitical, one of its meanings is uh, an aversion to politics or uh, wanting to stay a fa- as far away from politics as possible. And I think this is the sense of apolitical that many civ mill scholars are arguing for in an argument that I call the uh, borning consensus, which is that there's a distinction between the political and the partisan, that the military professional is supposed to be both individually and as an institution political, but is supposed to be uh, nonpartisan. And so they don't like the word apolitical when it comes up in Twitter feeds or in official discussions or in run of the mill discussions, you know, with colleagues in the lunchroom. The key is that apolitical has other meanings. And one of them is political neutrality in the sense of n- not design an affiliation among political parties that are rivals. So apolitical has dictionary definitions, many of them, uh, which state that to be apolitical could mean that I don't want to be a Republican or a Democrat. And if we think about the official role of journalists or bureaucrats, or Supreme Court justices, or military professionals, uh, we don't want them to be Republican or Democrat in their official capacities. Mm -hmm. We want Mm -hmm. them to be neutral. And for some reason, uh, those who advocate for the aborning consensus uh, just ignore that. (laughs) And it's as if uh, words mean what I want them to mean and nothing else and nothing more. And I I don't think that that's a good uh, way to proceed. Uh, If I may, I think there's three lessons here uh, Mm -hmm. that are pedagogical. So one of them relates to uh, uh, in infusing in our students and military professionals a comfort with polysemy. Uh, we're fond of saying in the military that words mean things. And my retort to that is, yes, it's true. 
polysemy, words mean many things. And it's important for our students to understand this, that this is part of the linguistic world in which uh, they're going to operate. And that interagency partners, uh, multinational partners, those partners who work in local areas where military professionals are deployed to, they're going to use the language in different ways. And we just have to be comfortable with that. So General Votel, you know, argues that we should be apolitical. Uh, Christine Warmoth, most recently at the uh, Associ- Association of the United States Army uh, Conference in Washington, D.C., said that uh, the military professional is to be apolitical. And we think what they mean by that is simply having no affiliation between Republicans and Democrats. And we understand this. Now, the, the distinction is to be drawn for the members of the aborting consensus between political and partisan. But if we take a look at uh, what Chief Justice uh, John Roberts has said on the Supreme Court and what uh, Judge Associate Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor have stated, they both reject the term political for the Supreme Court because they mean by political partisan. So Sonia Sotomayor says, we don't want the stench of partisan politics to attach to the Supreme Court. And Justice Roberts will say, we are not political when we make our decisions. And then my teacher uh, at Indiana University was the editor of Perspectives on Politics, presumably someone who knows about political language and how to use it. And he was writing on the one-year anniversary of the January 6th uh, uh, attack on the, on the Capitol. And he says, uh, he praises another politician for being seriously political. And by which he meant by that, naming the ongoing danger, demonizing the villains, and exercising their political authority to take concrete steps to fight the opponents of democracy. So seriously political for Jeff Isaac meant seriously partisan. Well, and, and I want to jump in here because that's, that's, that I think gets to a, a very important point is that often... I would argue, when people use the word uh, political or apolitical, they are essentially casting aspersions on the political, right? They're saying, I am a professional person. I am not political because God forbid I should be considered, you know, uh, dirty. And yet politics is a perfectly legitimate thing to have happen in a free society, right? We are going to have political debates. Um, And so... How do we deal with the fact that right words have multiple meanings? And so some one person's seriously political means someone who's actually, let's say, politically aware and politically savvy about the issues it's at hand, whereas somebody else's use of the word political is to suggest somehow corrupt or dishonest. Uh, should we just avoid using the word altogether because it has too many meanings? Well, if we if we really think about it, many of the words that we use, whether as citizens or as scholars or military professionals in our regular discourse, um, they entail what uh, William Conley described as essentially contestable concepts. So when we use a word like politics or political or freedom or justice or liberal or neoliberal, uh, we are obliged to then follow up and say, by which I mean the following, mm-hmm. for the sake of conversation. Mm-hmm. And if we do that as a regular practice, then we honor the fact that, that uh, there are many different definitions for the words that we're using. We don't discount those other perspectives, but we say for the business at hand, whether for the citizen or the scholar, we're going to continue with this definition. And many really good scholars do. It started with Aristotle, all the way to contemporary scholars like Agnes Keller, the philosopher. Uh, so I think that's the best way uh, to proceed. Uh, this this book by William Conley in 1974 called The Terms of Political Discourse uh, used politics and the political as the very archetype of an essentially contestable concept within the domain of politics. So I think that we want to model our behavior uh, in ways that our students, you know, for our students. And so what that means is when we come across a term and we want to make a distinction between this term and another, we, sh- we owe it to the scholarly community to go back and do a lit review. And we ask, you know, who else has studied the definition of politics? Who else has offered different conceptions? And then we bring those in and we wrestle with them in a scholarly way. And then we give our view. But there's a second component to that. And that the scholar should also be a curator. Mm-hmm. So it's not right simply to uh, issue 
direction from a scholar to a layperson, say a student, on the meaning of a term, when we know that it has multiple meanings uh, coming from other scholars. So we should curate the discipline and say, hey, politics means this for our classroom. However, be aware that there are, this, there are these other views out there, and you're going to hear them, and you're going to have to honor them. And uh, maybe that those views also have something to teach you. So is there, therefore, a useful distinction to be made between being political and being partisan? I, I, I think it depends on what you mean by political. So mm -hmm. in some senses, uh, politics uh, seeps into uh, the military profession. Uh, Don Snyder famously stated you know, that we are partly a bureaucracy mm -hmm. and we are partly a profession. Mm -hmm. Well, a bureaucracy engages in what we teach our students here, bureaucratic politics. Mm -hmm. So there's needs to defend the norms. There's needs to obtain resources for uh, the bureaucracy. When politics and organizations mix, they can go head to head with other bureaucracies in a fight. So you can think of this uh, uh, happening on the National Security Council. So in these respects, uh, the military, insofar as it is a bureaucracy, engages in bureaucratic politics. Mm -hmm. But in a very, in another sense, uh, the military is not like the Senate or the House of Representatives or the presidency, where those offices are filled with persons who are advancing specific values in what Max Weber called a struggle. He said politics is a struggle, not merely a process, but it's value struggle. And this is significant uh, uh, for our students to understand. Uh, one of the advocates, well, many of the advocates of, um, of uh, the distinction between politics and partisan want to say something like, politics is simply X, or, partisan, uh, or politics is nothing but X. And they want to say that it's simply a process. And this is one way of looking at it. And indeed, when we look at civics textbooks, uh, the kind of textbooks that we give to, say, freshmen or sophomores in university, uh, these are the definitions that you're going to find. Uh, Laswell's famous definition of who gets what, where, how, etc. But there's other scholars speaking in much more uh, normative and, and uh, conceptually uh, sophisticated ways about the terms politics and political. And if we really want to understand society, and especially globally, then we need to come to grips that other people disagree when you say this politics is simply X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. uh, one easy example would be the idea that politics isn't dirty. You know, why is it, why is it a pejorative? Mm -hmm. Well, if politics to you is a policeman coming into your neighborhood and abusing uh, those persons who live in the neighborhood, or politics stands for apartheid or separate but equal education, or decisions made uh, that hurt a community, but don't include the, the community leaders' uh, decision making uh, in the in what what comes about. Well, there's no surprise that politics is going to take on a dirty meaning. The key is that many people use these terms comfortably, and we know how to shift gears when people say, "Don't be political," right? Uh, especially political. in Congress. Well, and uh, I didn't say this during the during when I introduced you at the beginning of the program. But, uh, but you, of course, spent a, a big chunk of your professional life wearing the uniform um, um, as, an, as an officer in the, in, in the United States Army. And I am curious to know how your understanding about politics, either in a practical sense of sort of how you've studied it or, or just your way of thinking about it, how, if at all, has that changed as you've gone from, from being a, uh, a soldier scholar, if you will, to being a retired soldier scholar, and now you are, you are teaching at a professional military institution, um, but uh, from the perspective of a, a PhD in political science, right? Does, did, did anything change for you in the way you thought about politics as the roles that you have played have changed over time? Oh, I think so. Uh, I, I know that I fell in love with politics uh, when I was a sophomore at West Point, and I had a, a, a political philosophy teacher, John Dister, uh, who was describing, uh, who you know, teaching us Machiavelli and Plato and Aristotle and Rousseau and Hobbes, and I just fell in love with this, with these different conceptions of what politics entailed. And uh, and I uh, 
uh, decided to get a PhD then as a sophomore, <laughs> if I survived West Point, which was you know not a not a foregone conclusion. Uh, but I was able to go back and teach at West Point, and it's interesting that the things that I taught at West Point, the way that I taught them, I would teach differently today. And so that I think my role here at the War College, I'm able to articulate a more sophisticated understanding of politics than I was as a captain or major to the cadets. Mm -hmm. Um, But also through experience as a military professional in Iraq, uh, I found myself in a position where I was having to choose winners and losers, uh, allies and enemies in Iraq in ways that our counterinsurgency doctrine didn't describe. Mm-hmm. And so uh, my most recent piece in the Journal of Military Ethics describes a situation uh, which happened multiple times in both Iraq and Afghanistan where, where tactical commanders were being politicians. They were deciding whom they were going to ally with in terms of the armed groups, whom they were going to designate enemies and proceeding as such. And sometimes they did it with due diligence and sometimes they kind of did it hastily. But uh, this, this idea of politics is really, really complex. Right. Well, and and you you uh, your answer just then got me thinking about a question that I have imperfectly formulated in my mind, but I'm going to ask it anyway because we're because we're having this conversation. And that is, as instructors at the War College, you and I have both had the experience of occasionally having someone push back against a discussion, saying, "This is all very well and good and very esoteric and intellectual, but how does this actually affect?" my ability as a war fighter. And I, you, you hinted at how there are, there are ways that what, what can seem like a very esoteric question, right? What is politics? How do we, how do we be political? Um, actually directly influences the, uh, the actions of a military commander in the field. Um, how do you deal with the maintaining a balance as a professor at the War College between wanting to introduce your students to difficult and sometimes rather abstract questions, while also understanding that part of this is training, is helping people to become uh, strategic leaders and to think about what it means to be a, a, an educated war fighter. Well, I think in, in a normal uh, non-PME school, mm-hmm. uh, we have the idea of Max Weber's politics as a vocation, in science or scholarship uh, uh, as a vocation. And in his idea of making this distinction, the teacher has no obligation to be charismatic, right? The teacher is simply uh, supposed to get the causal story right, Right. is what he argues. Of course, we've all had plenty of teachers who failed to be charismatic (laughs) over the years, right? (laughs) <laughs> the politician is supposed to be charismatic. Right, the politician is right. engaged in, in aggregating coalitions uh, in a value struggle with others. Um, but I think here at the War College, because we're dealing with practitioners who are so steeped in, in technical and, and mechanical and, and really labor-driven uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, war fighting, that we need to make uh, the scholarship of war, of strategy, of policy uh, – digestible to them in ways that they understand how it relates to their um, to their career. So Mao Zedong uh, would describe uh, simple-minded militarists in the translation is what, what he says, uh, who are those people who say that the military is you know one thing and all they want to worry about is the military and politics is something else altogether. Think of Huntington's you know, two, two spheres. Uh, well, Mao says that this is ridiculous and that, that the military... And the political domains are different, but the military professional, the military person needs to understand a politics. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? So what I do try to do to my students is teach them different conceptions of politics, which serve as proxies for how different people view politics in the world. And it's from these views that you get political violence and you get war, where which leads to deployments of the soldiers. So they need to understand how it is that war arises. But if we think about uh, Vanessa Guillen at Fort Hood and the Inspector General report that happened, uh, this, this remedying those dangers, the, 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 that, that, that scandal so it doesn't happen again, requires military professionals to be attuned to other persons' views of power relations, of what's going on, and unless you're open to hearing those views, you know, from someone like Vanessa Guillen, hey, something's going on here and it's not right. There's no way that you're going to be able to fix it because you're, it's closed off to you. 
Uh, the same thing in dealings with interagency partners, with multinational partners, um, in dealings with top military commanders and the president. Uh, we need to be open to these different perspectives. And so this is why I'm really uh, uh, emphatic about this idea. If you close off politics to simply its to process-oriented definition, you've closed yourself off from all these different views right. of what politics can be. So now that I have you here too, so we, I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to have several discussions about civil military relations in different ways here on a better piece. We've already had Alice Hunt friend. Now we're having you, we're going to have, she's you know, wonderful. Yes. Uh, absolutely. And, and what I notice is when, when I have discussions about civil military relations with people of the current scholarly generation, everybody mentions Samuel Huntington only to say how he got it wrong. Are we in a situation where Sam Huntington has now, the soldier in the state is like Ptolemy's vision of the heavens, right? We only bring him up so that we can hurry up to explain why Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler proved Ptolemy wrong. Um, or is there something still that can be that can be helpfully salvaged from the soldier in the state, which is, obviously people are still reading, Um what can we still take away from that, even if we even if we believe that Huntington may have overstated this idea of the completely separate spheres? Well, we should still read him because he's a useful foil, just like Samuel Huntington <laughs> in other respects, or even John Mearsheimer today. Uh, we put him out there so we can attack. Um, I do think that there may be a caricature of Huntington that, that mm -hmm. although he's guilty of many of the sins, perhaps that we uh, uh, give to him that that there are you know, parts of uh, a soldier in the state where he does describe that there's an overlap, you know, between mm -hmm. what the military and what the military professional is supposed to do. But I'm also not aware here at the War College of anyone who's advocating for a strict separation where there is no right. overlap. I right. think that is uh, maybe a straw man mm -hmm. uh, uh, argument and that no one's pushing for that view. Now, Votel and, and Christine Warmworth both were able to use this term apolitical mm -hmm. in a way that we understood what they meant. Right. And I don't think the dangers trace back to Huntington. So we should still re read Huntington in contradistinction to, you know, Morris Janowitz and the mm -hmm. other uh, scholars who are out there. But the, the problem is more deep, deep seated. If you think of a character like Hotspur in Shakespeare's One Henry IV, you know, he's also, hey, the military is what I do and I don't think about anything else. And so I think regardless of whether Huntington had written that way or not, we're still going to get uh, military people who are used to going to the field right. and finding the enemy and engaging in battle, Yes, having difficulty thinking about politics. So yeah. it's something that we always have to, to, to address. Well, and, and this, see, this, this is fascinating and I don't want to, I don't want to get completely lost in the weeds here, but I will say that literature is full of these examples of the honest, plain spoken hero who comes back from the field and essentially shows all the politicians, you know, what's, what it's really all about. Um, and uh, we can, one can, one can go, one can go too far with that notion, right? Because somebody needs to know how to make the political work. And so if we, if we have this idea I mean, it's a little bit like the the ongoing debate in politics, right? Or the debate between between expertise and common sense. Um, that you know, um, nobody wants to say, right? I'm all in on on uh, on common sense because they understand that I might want a trained physician to remove my appendix. But nobody's gonna nobody's gonna say that experts always get things right either because they get things wrong. Um, and I and so when I think about you know wh when you say that part of this is when people say that the military should be apolitical, part of it is they they should the military should avoid controversy. When when Secretary of the Army Weymouth was talking about the general's comments in response to a television commentator, um, she was not her argument against being being political was to avoid having uniformed senior officers getting into arguments with people on their public Twitter feeds, which is really not the same thing as saying don't get involved in politics it's basically saying right don't get don't get bogged down in discussions that are beneath your uh, your rank or your importance so what can we or how can we develop a vision of the political um, and the relationship between the political and the partisan or whatever that can help us shape uh, not only the study of civil military relations but the the training of senior leaders in the military that they can be effective uh, operators, let's say, in the political world, while recognizing 
the limits of what they should avoid. Right. Um, the best way to do it is, I think, to read the, the, the top scholarship in civil military relations. So Heidi Urban is someone who has written a lot about uh, social media use and, and how it is that service members violate the norms of appropriate behavior through uh, partisanship on social media platforms. Mm-hmm. We should study those cases, take a look at what they, you know, how do they actually appear and, and, and create norms uh, in a mindful way in places like the War College and others about how not to do that. Reza Brooks in the uh, you know, famous international security article uh, criticizes General McChrystal for uh, providing tendentious options you know, to, mm-hmm. to the president. Well, let's study the nuts and bolts of this case that she presents. Uh, same thing with uh, General Milley, Lafayette Square. Uh, General Milley noticed he knew he did wrong, and he gave an apology at National Defense University. Let's study this case and talk about it. So what we do is we pick exemplary behavior and non-exemplary behavior, and we study the cases. And what we do is we actually study the complexity of what politics is and our relationship to it. Uh, and we avoid putting simplistic linguistic solutions to very complex problems. Because I can tell you, suppose everybody in the world believes in this distinction between politics and partisanship, that's not going to solve the problem for you. It's much, much uh, deeper. So the other part of it is, in, is then to understand the beautiful plurality of different competing conceptions of what politics is. And I think for a military professional in a liberal democracy, to become familiar with some of these views, and we can talk about them or, or some other time or now, uh, by becoming familiar with them, we can become almost prouder mm-hmm. of the oath that we take and of the experiment that we have in the United States in terms of a constitutional republic, in terms of a liberal democracy. I mean, a, a, a free society, a constitutional republic is built around people constructively disagreeing. Um, and so we can't then tell the people who are responsible for defending that constitutional republic. Oh, by the way, you're never allowed to disagree with anything. That wouldn't make any sense. Yeah, uh, Nancy Rosenblum in 2008 wrote a book on partisanship in a celebratory way. She says, mm-hmm. you only have true politics where you have pluralism, where you have contestation. Mm-hmm. And so then we go back to Plato's Republic, where there is no contestation. The philosopher kings rule because they have to, <laughs> and no one's arguing amongst themselves. Or do they just know the right thing to do. Well, some of the views of Chantal Mouffe and, and, and uh, Wendy Brown and others, they're arguing against conceptions of politics that they call post-political or anti-political. And this is really prevalent around the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, where people said, much like Fukuyama, hey, you know, ideological struggle is over. Mm-hmm. Now we can simply reduce politics to administration which means the expert resolution of minor problems that if experts apply their skill set, we can, we can take care of everything. And all these big, deep-seated struggles between identities and ideologies, they'll go away. Well, that isn't politics. And that's, those are manifestations on both the left and the right. And what these scholars are arguing for is, no, you have to honor the contestation, the plurality. You can't simply go for unity and, and, and complete cohesion politically because you're always going to leave somebody out. Well, you're always going to leave somebody out. And then there's, but then the flip side of this is within the military, um, there has to be a system of, of, uh, of giving and following orders and of uniformity. Right. They literally people wear uniforms. Right. They get they're, they're required to cut their hair a particular way. People surrender some of their freedom as citizens, even as they are defending a free society as citizens in uniform. Uh, how should military leaders and individual members of the military see the relationship between their roles as citizens in a constitutional republic and members of an organization that is by its very nature hierarchical and uh, regimented. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, they need to understand, first of all, that when in our system, the president gives an order mm-hmm. and that order is legal and, 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 and moral that we carry it out. Mm-hmm. That's uh, pretty simple. We may disagree with it, but we carry it out. Uh, but politics also seeps into our day rooms, uh, into our motor pools, into our grooming standards and grooming regulations. 
uh, Beth Bailey uh, was at the Signal Center to talk here uh, last week, talking about uh, politics plays. Oh, she didn't use the term politics, but she goes, she talked about how it is that what's available at the PX. Is it something that, you know, African-American soldiers are able to buy that takes care of their needs? Right. And so politics seeps into everything that we do. Uh, and so we see now diversity, equity, and inclusion is a partisan issue outside of the military. Mm -hmm. But with the example of uh, Major General Donahue that you gave, it's also Donahue, It's also inside uh, the military. Right. And military professionals need to get accustomed to that. Hmm. So is it is it like the the old line about uh, uh, the only way to deal with troublesome speech is by adding more speech? So the way to deal with troublesome politics is to add more politics, Tina? It's, it's <laughs> well, it, there was a podcast, uh, if I can talk about uh, War on the Rocks podcast with Risa Brooks and Alice Unfriend, which is pretty recent. Yes. Uh, they began talking about how they nerd out on the intricacies mm -hmm. of civil mm -hmm. relations. Right. Well, the military domain also has intricacies. Uh, we have an entire first floor of teachers dedicated toward te towards teaching our students. Well, there are many people talking about what politics is, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, what the political is, and those also have intricacies. And the key is for soldiers to become familiar with those intricacies to the degree necessary to do their jobs. Uh, yeah. We can't close off. We can't simplify it artificially by fiat. Politics is this and partisanship is that, be one and not the other. It just doesn't work. Uh, so we need to honor the complexity, the intricacies that are involved. And if we think about it, this is a much lighter task than actually sending military professionals to go do something against, you know, some near peer competitor or some, you know, insurgent foe. That war is much more complex than the linguistics that is a part of it. So we shouldn't be afraid of the linguistics. If we're if we're going to be brave, if we're going to be brave in the face of the enemy, we can be brave in the face of complex topics too. Right. We should. It's a scholarly bravery. Warrior scholars. You know. Warrior right? scholars. Well, this is. I, I tell you what. We've come full circle. Um, uh, this this conversations like this one are exactly the sort of complexity and exactly the sort of of honest uh, sort of evaluation of complexity that we hope for, that we hope to do here at the War College and we hope to do here at A Better Peace. Uh, Tino Perez, we're out of time for today, but thanks so much for joining us for this conversation here today. Thanks for the opportunity, Ron. I appreciate it. A lot of fun. You bet. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and all the programs. Please send us your suggestions for future programs. We're always interested in hearing from you. Please take a moment after you've listened to this conversation and uh, subscribe to A Better Peace on your podcatcher of choice, because why wouldn't you want to subscribe to A Better Peace? And after you've subscribed, please rate and review this podcast on your podcatcher of choice so that other people can learn about us so that we can continue to grow the community for conversations like this one. This conversation is over, but we look forward to welcoming you to the next one. And so until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.